and we emphasized how we should try to develop the same disposition toward transgressing God's law that God has. And we saw the place prepared for those who die unforgiven of their sins. Well, we talked about His anger, and we also talked about His love, and we talked about how His justice and anger go together. Now this afternoon, I'd like to talk about my anger and your anger. And writing about the differences between Christian conduct or behavior and worldly conduct, the inspired Apostle Paul said to the Ephesians, Be ye angry and sin not. Ephesians 4.26 Be ye angry. There is a state of being anger. And he says to Christians, Be ye angry, in effect, but do not sin when you are. This is different from the world. The world tends to display its anger and bring hurt to others when it does. I saw one of the most ridiculous, absurd things I believe the other day on YouTube I ever saw. It was two Chinese men somewhere over in Asia. And I don't know what they got angry about with one another. But each one started spitting in another's face, and that's all that the fight was all about. They just tried to outspit one another. And finally one did, and the other one quit. <laughs> well, you got situations like that to where you, you just shake your head. But then there are those situations where people shoot one another, cut one another, and beat one another over the head in a display of anger. Whatever the motivation was, it caused them to be angry. I realize sometimes that people can hurt other people in simply engaging in self-defense because they want to protect themselves. But I'm talking about the power that God gave us. You know, He gave us power to be happy. He gave us the ability to be full of sorrow. He gave us the ability to be angry. Uh, why do we have those emotional parts of us. And what are we to do with them? I say, what are we to do with them? Because we're in control of ourselves. God says, what you have, you control. But now left to yourself, you don't know how to control them. And you may not even control them. Because you see, the scripture that says, there is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death, fits the control of yourself. There's much in the New Testament that talks about be sober, Talks about be rational. Talks about self-control. So we are expected to control ourselves as the Lord wants us to control ourselves. But nevertheless, He made us where we could be happy. and He made us where we could be angry. Now this quotation that I gave you from Ephesians 4.26, Be ye angry and sin not, is from Psalm 4 and verse 4. Both the King James Version and the American Standard 1901 read, Stand in awe, A W E, stand in awe and sin not. Moreover, the ASV mentions in a footnote that stand in awe may be translated, Be ye angry. In this psalm, David is comparable to what Paul said, or wrote comparable to what Paul said in Ephesians 4.26. And he's actually contrasting the sons of men, verse 2, with godly people, verse 3. And the point that's being made is that it's characteristic of the godly to be ye angry and sin not. It's not that way necessarily with people who don't care what God said and 
who do as they please. And that gives more impetus to what is meant when Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus and to us in the New Testament and said, be ye angry and sin not. It's characteristic of faithful children of God exercising self-control to be angry and sin not. Not transgress God's law, for that is what sin is, 1 John 3 and verse 4. So we conclude that we ought not to sin as worldly people do sin when they become angry. But in contrast to their behavior, we become angry if we're what we ought to be, and we sin not. Now, you notice this morning we talked about God's anger and His wrath. Well, have you ever thought about the fact that when God is angry at something, shouldn't I be angry about it? I'd hate to know God is angry at something. I say, well, I'm not going to be angry about that. I'm not supposed to be angry. Yeah, but God's angry. Well, I'm sorry. I the Bible says I can't be angry. Well, it never does say that. It says, be ye angry and sin not. In fact, it bothers me greatly that some people who say, I'm of Christ. I'm walking in the steps of Jesus. I'm seeking for Christ to control my thoughts and actions. And they don't ever become angry at wicked, bad, hateful, mean, terrible, dirty things. When the Bible says God does. Seems to me we ought to learn to be angry at what God's angry at, just like we ought to love like God loves. And display our emotions in the same way. I think it's terribly bad that when parents are expected to rear their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and their children cannot see coming from their parents controlled, sane, sober anger when their children go against what they're supposed to do what they've been trained to do, what is right, or when they go out and just do something wrong. It doesn't mean we don't love them any more than when it says God loved the world and gave His only begotten Son. It still says He becomes angry at sin. Well, aren't, aren't they compatible that He can love me, give His Son to die for me, but at the same time, He becomes angry at the wicked? So we sometimes just don't understand what the Bible is saying about anger. It, it angers me when I, I got up this morning and I was watching the news and I happened to see what happened yesterday morning. And here was a manager of a restaurant who was going to let an employer in or employee in because somebody was trying to steal a purse, something like that. Cross of letting them in, the guy that was trying to steal it tried to get and killed her. That makes me angry. Am I supposed to be happy and giddy about that and say, whoopee? Or just, you know, nothing. Just ignore it because it goes on every day here and all over the country and the world. Oh, that makes me angry. But that's what I do about it with my anger. It's the control of myself is what I do about it. It makes me want to be more determined to try to get the gospel to people. That's the only thing that's going to really change people. There's nothing else that's going to do it when people understand these things. It makes me appreciate what the New Testament says about the laws of the land, Romans 13. That's from God's mind concerning how to deal with people. That's one of the ways he exercises his anger over the wicked is to give civil authorities the power they have to even put people to death if they do things, as Paul said, worthy of death. So we all know that God doesn't expect us to rejoice when people sin, when they do wrong. And we must be angry at sin. Psalm 7 and verse 11, God judgeth the righteous. Now think of this. And God is angry with the wicked every day. Pretty plain, isn't he? Well, he, he's angry every day, you know it? Because I don't know of a day that wicked aren't doing wicked things. Wicked people aren't doing wicked things. That's what makes them wicked people, you do wicked things. And all those things are contrary to God's will, contrary to the way God would have us live. 
in 2 Corinthians 7, where Paul's talking about how the brethren at Corinth responded to his first letter and also how they viewed their lives back in the world, he writes of the indignation that the Corinthian brethren had concerning the sin in which they had once lived. It might do us well as Christians to think about how upset we are now at the way we at one time lived. I think all of us can call to mind things we did or didn't do and say, I wouldn't do that again. Don't know why I did it then. But the time you did it, you had no problem knowing why you did it. But you've grown, haven't you? You learn to take a viewpoint from the Scriptures regarding life and mankind and how He controls Himself and how God wants it done. Now, I want you to look at Mark chapter 11, verses 15 through 17. Mark 11, 15 through 17. And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats that, uh, of them that sold doves. And would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, It is not written, My house is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer. And ye made it a den of thieves. Now I just uh, knowing Jesus was a man like you are and I am, and he was uh, upset at that situation, I don't think he smiled in some sort of sick, syrupy look on his face, said, No, 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 boys, let's don't do that. You don't get that idea. Why make him out something that he's not and that you're not? He was upset at them, and he displayed it. And the scribes and chief priests knew that because look at verse 18. The scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. I think we would be too because he taught them as one having authority. If you look back over at uh, Matthew 5.22, you get some of the same uh, ideas given to us. But I say unto you, Jesus said, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, now I want to understand, underline that without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the counsel, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. That's pretty plain language if you ask me. And notice the point without a cause. When people do wrong, that is a cause. Whatever the wrong may be, whatever the sin may be. And because they did it, means that if you're what the Bible says you ought to be, that upsets you. Does it upset you when brethren sin? I don't mean you're flying on with a baseball bat and trying to beat them over the head. I don't mean that kind of thing. All there are times one is sorely tempted. And I will say this. I remember this happening one time. It just crossed my mind. There was a gospel meeting going on in Arkansas. I knew the preacher that preached it. He was older than I was. At the time, anyway. And he had held a number of meetings there, and he knew the people, and known them over the years. And there was a man he had known for years who was out of duty. He was unfaithful. So when he went there, he decided he'd go talk to him. And the fellow was full of all sorts of excuses. And he told him, he said, you know, if your children... After all that you've taught them about right and wrong and the example of living that you set before them were to make excuses like you're making as to why you're not obeying the Lord after all these years. And you know I know what you know. You know that I understand this. He said, you ought to be taken out and stretched over a barrel and just blistered just like a little child until you opened your eyes and saw how you're headed for hell. Like I say, sometimes we're sorely tempted to do that kind of thing. The point is, you've got to get people to understand how heinous and evil sin is. 
If you die in sin, God's going to send you to torment. Me too. I'm not talking about the person striving to do right and as a human being making mistakes and confessing sins and praying for them and struggling like we all do. But I'm talking about people who know they commit sin, either of omission or commission, and they drift off into it and they don't try to change. They've heard invitation songs and they've thought about the sermons as the invitation songs were sung. They knew they were out of duty to God or they weren't a Christian and they just kept going right on down like God will never do anything to me. But he is. It's like we studied this morning. At the end of all things, he will send you to torment. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, I don't like that. I'm a member of the body of Christ. I've been a Christian for a long time. And it upsets me that there are people who are in sin and they're going to lose their soul and you cannot turn them about. Does that upset you? That doesn't mean you weren't, as I say, flying on them Beat them up. It's not that kind of anger. We have the anger the Bible teaches we ought to have. But I don't see people getting angry like that sometimes. Brethren miss services off and on for a period of I don't know how long and then just take it in stride. Like no big deal. God didn't really care. But he does. And he takes note of it. And he knows everything that we therefore must give account of on the day of judgment. If you look with me over to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. The interesting statement here. Beginning in verse 1, he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. Now think about that. We've all seen people that have that are crippled in some way. This man has a withered hand. Notice the attitude of those who didn't like him at all. And they watched him. Whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. You know those folks had had the law of Moses for 1,500 years by this time. And they didn't understand the design and purpose of the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath. They simply didn't understand that the Sabbath day and keeping it never was designed to stop a Jew from doing good. Never did. Notice verse 3, And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. Well, well, they should. They couldn't answer it. If they'd answered it, they would have had to answer, it's all right. It's good. It's good to do good on the Sabbath day. They certainly weren't going to say it's good to do evil on the Sabbath day. And when they didn't answer, watch verse 5. And he and when he had looked round about on them with anger. Do you think they knew he was angry with them? I know he was because God's good word says he was. And think about what they did and their warped view and that he could work miracles and they'd get mad because he worked a miracle to do good to a person on the Sabbath day. That's how corroded they had become in their consciences. Notice he was grieved for the hardness of their hearts. He was grieved and he was angry. You ever been that way? There's something wrong with people when we see folks in such a state as these that were watching him and you don't have that kind of thought or emotion cross your mind. Well, he then said, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored whole as the other. Now look immediately in verse 6. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. You know, even today when I read this, I realize this actually happened. That makes me angry that there are people in the world like that. It doesn't make me want to see them nailed to a cross, but it makes me want to 
teach the truth. It makes me want to teach the truth to those who are persuaded by them to get them out from under that kind of false view, that kind of attitude. We're talking about being righteously indignant. When we get angry, so many times it's because you stepped on my foot. Or you did something to me personally. It had nothing to do with violation of God's will. You went against me. That's not good. The Bible speaks right the opposite of that kind of thing. But if you notice when Jesus gets angry, when he is righteously indignant, and that tells you the kind of anger it was and why he got anger, angry, it's because of what they were doing to God's word and how it affected other people as they twisted it. Now, the light of all we've said here, we need to understand better how to channel our anger so that it will be truly, rightly, and correctly righteously indignant. Well, the first thing we want to do is not be quick to anger because you don't have time to think about something when you do that. I've seen times over the years, though it come sporadically it's not all the time but I wanted somebody to know I was angry with them and I wanted them to know why I was angry with them and the reason we do things must be the right reason many sins are committed by people because their anger caused them to lose their self-control and to become irrational. You ever try to reason with an irrational person? You won't get anywhere. You won't get anywhere at all. As soon as you realize that person is not willing to reason from the facts and do something about it, just stop and leave them alone. You're wasting your time. Their words to no profit. What happens is, as it used to be said, something happens personally to us or whatever. We fly off the handle. I don't know. I guess that still means you lose your temper. <laughs> you don't have any self-control. And that's when we say things and do things we, we later greatly regret. But sometimes, brethren, there ought to be some calculated, I am angry at you. Because you have done wrong and you will not repent of the wrong you know you've done and you know you're on the way to torment and I'm angry with you, but more than that, so is God and that's the reason I am. Because that kind of anger will cause you to seek the best for that person. And that's what we ought to be doing. I just know what I've seen over the years in my own life and in trying to teach others in the way people are. That we've heard so much of, well, love, 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 and it's been warped. And then we just don't think we can become angry. That's why I delivered that sermon this morning to show you God is mad. And I read one this afternoon from Psalms. He's angry at the wicked every day. That means he's angry every day, all day long, at the wicked. It seems to me the church ought to be angry at the wicked every day. And it should get the same response from faithful members of the church of the body of Christ and seeking to save the lost as it does from God. Remember, God's long-suffering, not, not willing that any should perish. Well, he's angry at the wicked every day, but he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's what we need. This business of being quick to anger is what causes these crimes of passion, as they're called. It's a striking out. Proverbs 15, 18 said, A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. Next of all, when provoked, think before you become angry. You've got to think about what you're going to say. It's not just that you say it with sternness so the person will know that you're upset, but it's the meaning of the words you choose when you say what you say displaying that you're upset when you say it. Now, is this a situation over which it's worth becoming angry? That's what we ought to ask. Am I angry because of the way I 
was personally treated? Am I angry because of this situation or am I angry because something bad in another part of my life is affecting my judgment? What do I mean by that? You're at work. Somebody treats you bad at work. Maybe the boss jumps on you about something and you won't really let it be known how you felt about that. And you go home and the cat crosses your way and you kick the cat. You ever heard that? Or your wife happens to show up too quick and on her you jump. (laughs) And what we're doing then is venting our frustrations. That's not acceptable. James um, arranges it in this way. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, that every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. He said he didn't say never, never be angry. See, Paul didn't either. Be ye angry and sin not. That's what godly people do. And that's because they're slow to wrath. But it doesn't mean you never become angry. Then, when we get angry, are we sure we're controlling ourselves? Because problems aren't solved by losing control. Controlling our actions is the key. And if our actions are not in control, then our thoughts are not in control. God demands that we bring, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, into captivity every thought, to the obedience of Christ. I've often used this passage and said, you don't think Christianity is a challenge to you all day long every day? Just try bringing every thought in your mind in subjection to the teaching of Christ all day long every day, and you'll see what a challenge it is. And it is, but that's what God said we're to do. That's our goal, that's our desire. And if we do, then we're going to be slow to wrath. We're going to have time to think. And it may need then still to be said, but we'll measure our words. And it will turn out more like Paul rebuking Peter to the face. The Greek means mouth to mouth. I often think of it. He gave him true mouth to mouth resuscitation. (laughs) It wasn't a pleasant thing. You can't read that over in Galatians where Paul reports that problem and say that was a pleasant situation. He says Peter played the hypocrite and and drew Barnabas and others along with him because of his actions of pulling away from the Gentile brethren because certain Jews who were brethren came down from Jerusalem. And and that was a bad situation. Imagine if that had been allowed to stand. If I'd been Paul, I'd have been upset about it. And I think he was. Because look at all he wrote about trying to get the Jews and Gentiles to be one. And knowing the only place that could happen will be by the gospel and they're all being one in Christ Jesus. He's broken down that middle wall of partition. And he did everything possible to have this oneness with brethren in the church. That had to upset Paul that he had to do that. Have you ever been upset to the point you just hated what had to be done? But it had to be done because for one reason. It was the right thing to do, and you were there. I go back to the time of David. Remember, that was written for our learning. Wonder why that David didn't say, well, my brothers are here, and they were here before me, and they've seen Goliath do this. Here's King Saul, and here's all the armies of Israel. Why must this fall my lot to go out here and face this giant? I haven't even been here. I've been home doing what they asked me to do there. I I defended my flocks when when time came and God was with me. He delivered a bear in my hand, a lion in my hand. And that was the view he took toward Goliath. But have you wondered, what, what was he thinking about the armies of the living God and letting that uncircumcised Philistine come out and defy them? Do you think that made him a happy camper? It wouldn't me and it wouldn't have you. I stood in that valley long years ago, and I reached down out of a little old stream bed that was dried up, and I got those rocks, and I stood there, and I looked across, and I thought, now, what would I have done if that had been me back there? Of course, I was kind of tickled. My name was David, but nevertheless, I wasn't the same one. And I thought, now, just think about that. And yet, here's all of the army of Israel, King Saul, here's all my brothers, and they're making light of me. Would that upset you? See, sometimes we kind of get ourselves in mental turmoil because we don't get mad when we ought to, and we don't get mad in the right way. 
Sometimes we don't speak up when we should. And we're quiet when we ought to speak up. So wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. We must resolve our anger within the same day that it's provoked. If we permit it to continue, it's going to fester. And it's going to come into bitterness. And that has a way of causing people just say, I give up and I quit. Because that's the ultimate fruit of festering anger, is to turn into bitterness, and it will destroy one's faith in God. The second half of Ephesians 4.26 says, Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now I realize you can't settle, settle a problem by yourself, it involves at least some other person. Because that person doesn't want it to settle. Then no matter how much you want it to be settled, it won't be. I know that's the case because God would have every one of us to be saved. Christ died for everybody, but all won't be saved because all will not heed the gospel and will submit to it. So even though God would have every man be saved, if it was just up to God, there would be a soul lost. But it's not just up to God. We're free moral agents. We have to choose to be saved God's way. And the same thing's true with the use of our emotions. You know, one time Joshua, after the AI, they'd been defeated at AI. Remember, he was just always oh, terribly upset, and he was down praying all this, that, and the other. You ever notice what God did? It's not time to pray. Get up and take care of the sin and the candle. There's a place for prayer. There's a place for lamenting. But it was the time to find the sinner and deal with him. And what did they do? They stoned him to death and everything that he had and all his whole family. Now that seems so strange. That seems so harsh. But when they were sent into Jericho before that, they were told not to take a thing out of that city. And they were told to kill everybody. Pregnant women, grandmas were holding their babies in their arms with their grandchildren, told to kill everybody there. And they had to bring their emotions under control to obey God to do it. We need to form the mind of God in us. And the New Testament is designed to do that. To cause us to employ and use our emotions under our intellects and will as the New Testament teaches us. We need to learn to love people and have compassion on them and mercy on them. Know when to say kind words. But even Paul said to the Corinthians, you want me to come to you with a rod on the spirit of love? Well, I think he would come to them in the spirit of love. And they show they were willing to be corrected and receive his letter and understand it and admit that they needed to repent. But there was such a thing as apostolic authority and apostolic discipline. And he's saying, I can do that too. I can come there and discipline you. I'd rather not do that because I've written everything to you enough to straighten up for those who will. So that's a thing that we need to realize. Paul even told some of the Galatians by the way they were drifting away from God so fast. He said, I'm afraid of you. There's a proper display of fear. I'm afraid of you. Afraid of you for what reason? You're giving up the truth so fast. I'm afraid of people like that. That's what he's saying. So while we have these emotions, who gave us these emotions? Who built us as human beings? God did. But like everything else, those emotions ought to be under the sway of the truth of God on the use of them. And that comes because we know the truth and we bring our life in subjection to the truth. And that's what we read a while ago, that we're to bring our mind into subjection to Christ. So anger is one of the most intense emotions that God has given us. But it can be used to a good purpose. So we need to resolve, and we'll sum it all up here, not to become angry hastily, to think before we become angry, to control our anger should we become angry, and to resolve our anger before the end of the day. Now, I don't pretend at all to have mastered becoming angry and having every bit of it just exactly in all cases under God's will, and nobody else can either because we are human beings. 
We're human beings. And everything that's involved in living a faithful Christian life in the church, there's times you're going to need to readjust things. You're going to need to grow and to develop. But I do know what the Bible says. I do know what needs to be put into practice by me or by everybody else. Regardless, I continue to desire to learn God's principles on this subject and the other subject in the Bible pertains to living the Christian life. And remember, God has given us and to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue, 2 Peter 1, 3. And then this admonition in the lesson's yours. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Yes, we all have these emotions and we have the mind of Christ and the use of them as we exercise control over them and put them to good use. So this is just something I hope that will help us all be better in dealing with ourselves. You ever been angry with yourself? Were you angry without a cause? Or did you need to be angry with yourself? Have you ever been sorrowful over what you did? Or didn't do? Have you ever been happy and rejoice? Certainly. I think all of us, once we obeyed the gospel and rose from that watery grave of baptism, we were just like the Ethiopian eunuch. We went on our way rejoicing and others rejoicing with us. That's because we knew we were in harmony with God's will, and that's the same is true on any of these areas, whether it's anger, sorrow, happiness, or whatever. If you're not a child of God uh, this afternoon, now's the time to become one. You need to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins to be a new creature. You need to live righteously then before God. Now you're able to see to begin to really bear down and learn what it is to shape and mold your life in the likeness of Christ and in dealing with one another. If you've sinned, you need to repent, confess those sins. And now's the time to do it. All together we stand and sing.